What's up everybody, welcome back to the channel. We got the old girl all polished and ready to rock. We think, we're not sure where the day's gonna take us. And for the first time in 10 years, brew on this guy. We're just gonna see what happens. So if you didn't watch the last video, we'll link it below. We pulled this guy out of the warehouse, cleaned it up and got it ready for a brew. And today we're gonna give it a shot. If you like what you see here, consider subscribing to the channel. We're gonna have some fun today, so I hope you enjoy it. Got my buddy Dylan with me right here. Actually, it's gonna be a couple minutes. We're still heating up to strike temperature. Yep. This is all grain brewing, so we're gonna mix hot water with grain. We're gonna convert the starches in the grain to sugar, and then we're gonna rinse those sugars into the kettle and boil it to make what's called wort. And from there, we're gonna ferment it. I think we're gonna shoot for 154, so I'll probably have our strike temperature around 170 degrees. We didn't do a dry run at all, so we're very much just, we're winging it. Yeah, I mean, just to put it into perspective, <laughs> we're, we're brewing simultaneously right now. We're running uh, greenish through the brew house right now, and this is the greenish salt dose, and then this is the, the little IPA that we're brewing on the Brew Magic salt dose. It's a little bit of a so water So scale difference. is a funny thing. All right, so this is a one-speed pump, right? Single-speed pump. The, the temperature in the heat exchanger right now is 65.7, but as soon as we put liquid through it, that yeah. temperature's gonna rise. Uh -huh. And then this is our target, and during the mash rest, we'll circulate through the heat exchanger to hopefully maintain that target for the duration of the mash. We'll probably rest for like 40 minutes. We don't need to rest for too long. Dude, this is a lot of pressure. I gotta throw that valve this whole time. But today we're making a little IPA. We're doing two row barley. We got a tiny amount of carafoam. And then just a little bit, just a little bit of oats for texture. And oats is something we don't normally use, but for the purposes of this recipe, we're gonna utilize it. We're gonna use Citra, Simcoe, and Amarillo in very, very small quantities. The analog stuff says 171. So we're slightly off. See this? Oh, I always trust computers. So one thing to know about me is that when I brew, I get relatively intense. So I'm gonna do my best. 10 years removed. Well, actually not 10 years, oh. All right, it's time to shut this guy off. We're ready to rock. I just tap it to hit on, huh? All right, go ahead. Open up your valve a little bit. There it is. Huh. All right, throttle it a little bit. Oh, all right. Well, hold on. What okay. just happened? I shut it off. I oh, turn it back scared. on. Turn it back on. <laughs> all right, now just throttle it back. That's good. We got 123 on that old mash temperature, bub. Well, it's going to climb fast because it's, oh, it's, it's going through your heating element. Dude, I'm not feeling this brewer's timer, though. It's making me feel rushed. So what's my volume right now over here? 40, just over 45 liters. All right, we're gonna go down to five gallons remaining. One five more gallons? Yeah, so okay, we're gonna start liters, to- Okay, 45 five gallons, got it, yeah. We're gonna no. start to add some grain. We're just gonna let this guy kind of trickle a little bit. So you're saying when I get to five gallons, that's our mash water? Correct. Well, okay. We're, we're at volume. Good thing I didn't do what I thought I was gonna do. I thought we would start graining this thing. I'm ready for grain. Oh, I thought I was, I'm the grain guy and the throttle guy, dude? Actually, you know what? I think if you pass me the grain, I can just do the grain. Thank God. Yeah. You happy with your water flow? Yeah. All right. I'm not feeling the strike temperature over here, though. I'll tell you that. What do you mean? What, what's it at? 117. 117? Yeah, but it, I mean, the line going in is hotter than that. All right, I closed, I closed that throttle too, so you're gonna have to tell me what you need. Go ahead, pump on. Okay. What's my residual water? You're just at nine gallons right now. Nine gallons remaining? Yeah, well, you got four gallons remaining. Okay. What is that, Nate? Uh, this is the secret sauce. That's what this is. This is the part that takes me years and years to develop that uh, He doesn't even tell me what it is. I, I leave up to put all the secret sauce and stuff. Leave up to others to determine what will work best for them. Second bucket, please. There you go. Thank you, sir. How are you looking up there, man? Are you happy with it so far? Yeah, I think I'm kinda happy with it so far. 
You think our paddle's big enough for that little keg? Uh, I think it's probably I a got hair it. too large, but ultimately <laughs> this is looking good, man. It smells good, it looks it good. It smells good. It's so little. You want to give me one more rinse on that, please? Yeah. This is awesome. Let's go a half gallon below. All right. Just because I think, well, I think we lost a little bit there on my calculation. Got it. You're probably around a half gallon below. All right, go ahead and kill it. Pumps off, valve shut. Thank you, sir. Am I refilling this guy for your sparges or what? Uh, Hey Siri, set a timer for 40 minutes. Dude, that was sweet. I'm gonna let this guy settle in. Nate, how difficult is it scaling up from this rig to what you're currently running? Uh, clearly this rig is a lot harder to use than what I'm currently running. I know there's a lot of misconceptions about scale in brewing and that when you when you go from one size to another size something magical happens that can make the beer not what it used to be but frankly i can tell you that that's not true we're over time we, we've just gotten better and more knowledgeable on our equipment and just made things better over time so constant modification constant iteration constant improvement so now we got to get this guy recirculating so now here's our suction now here's where I want to hook this guy up. Pass me that lining. Oh yeah, you're gonna boil and all that stuff. All right, throttle it back, throttle it back. That's uh, that, that looks good to me there. Nailed it. Dude, it smells good. All right, go ahead and put your lid on. Mm -hmm. Strike temperature, which is the temperature of the water interacting with the grain and then settling into your mash temperature is highly variable dependent upon the brew house, the season, and, and many different things. So historically, my strike temperature based on my old notes that I referenced before brewing this batch was between 15 and 16 degrees. Uh, and considering it's very, very cold over in this corner, we're getting hit with cold air. We came in a couple of degrees low right now. Our target here was 154, and we're sitting at 151.5 right now. We're just gonna apply a little bit of heat to bring that temperature up and get it in the line. Well, we were about a half a degree over where we wanted to be, so we came in a degree or two low, and then through trying to heat it up, we came in about a half a degree high. That will have marginal effect, if any effect at all, on that beer. This will be the last time we disturb the grain bed. We want the grain bed to settle out so that when we start to water into the kettle, it's super clarified. So I'll give it one quick little spin to try to increase the efficiency. And then from here on out, it's just gonna rest, settle, relax, before we run it off into the kettle. I'm uh, gonna start to prepare the sparge water. Again, at the beginning of the video, we talked about how we convert the starch in the grain into fermentable sugar. And then the second part of the process is we'll rinse that sugar into the wort kettle. In order to do that, we have to prepare our sparge water, which is what I'm doing now. Brewing is always kind of active waiting. There's sort of 10 or 20 minutes of action followed by preparing for the next step. And right now we're, we're prepping the water to, uh, to get rolling on the next step. I don't know if you got a shot of this when I had first mashed it in, but if you look at it now, that conversion has started. So when you first mash in, what you see is kind of milky and as you recirculate this wort and clarify and that conversion starts to happen, it starts to look more like kind of a grade A maple syrup and gets really nice and clear. And I can even kind of pull that out for you and show you right there that this is just beautiful sugar water. Oh, it just tastes great. It's got that real grainy, sweet, sugary flavor to it. It's just magic. But I'm gonna pull a sample right now. I'm gonna chill this down. I'm gonna check it for its specific gravity, its sugar content, and then I'm gonna check it for its pH and a few other attributes to make sure that we're dialed in right, right where we wanna be. I think we're gonna be in good shape. It's a moment of truth. <laughs> right on the money. Just adding some special ingredients, just kinda of dialing in 
all my pHs, temperatures, and things like that, just trying to lock everything in. Every step of the brewing process has to be hyper precise. Certainly it can be forgiving, but the more precise you are and the more locked in on your numbers you are, the better that beer is gonna turn out. The sparging liquor is ready, and then my mash has only, I think, 15 minutes left. Once that section is complete, we're gonna start to run off into the kettle while sparging. So it should be good. So we're just gonna do a simple iodine test. We're getting ready for our sparge. This, this test is typically done to ensure that you've had full conversion in your sacrification rest. Just take a little bit of that beautiful clean, clean wort, add some iodine to it, and all you do is make sure that it doesn't turn super black on you. It just kind of drops in there and then remains the same color. And that very, very simple test will tell you essentially right away whether or not you've You've got residual starch in here, which it appears that we don't. So we are fully converted. We're just gonna wait a few more minutes to enable it to clarify, and then we're gonna start our, our lottering process. I'm gonna kill this pump. I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna open all the way here. And I'm gonna open all the way here. Get that ready for the runoff. Before we start to add water to the top, I'm just gonna pull through here a few times. It's actually looking quite nice. I don't know that we're gonna have to run through here as many times as I thought. You don't want any extra tannins or polyphenols to make their way into the kettle if you can help it. This is looking great. It's looking awesome. All right, I'm gonna call that good there. And we're gonna start running off into the kettle. Low and slow is the name of the game. We're not in any rush here. We're all about getting it right. And then we're gonna start to add water. This is funny, we're actually lottering the batch of greenish in the uh, lotter ton right here at the same time. So for this first little part here, I'm gonna try to match the flow rate of water coming in the top with water going out the bottom, just so we don't overly compress that green bed and create a lottering issue. Yeah, you can see already, Michael, I'm not sure you can tiptoe up here, but already the wart has clarified here on top, and I'm just ever so gently adding hot water to the top here. I'm concerned that we're running off too fast, but it seems like it's holding up. I keep kind of dialing it back a little bit, but it's looking good. Again, it's not showing any signs of slowing down. The grain bed's not hyper well compacted. We're still lottering, we're still here. Kettle volume is like three quarters full, so I've now fired up the uh, propane. This guy is starting to heat to boil right now, and we're gonna get ready for some hop additions. We're actually moving along pretty quickly. I, I had forgotten how quickly you can move through a batch on a brew house this small. So I just turned off the sparge liquor, and now everything that's remaining in this vessel is just gonna kind of rinse through the grain bed, and we're gonna hit our kettle top of volume. Hopefully I got that number right. It's based on an absorption rate that's kind of not on this brewery specifically, much larger breweries, but we're gonna see how it turns out. I have no idea how I used to do all this uh, while like running the business at the same time. Uh, but up until like, I think midway through 2018, I was brewing essentially 100% of the time. The idea, like I'm thinking right now, I need to be, I have meetings that are supposed to be happening, I have Zoom calls that are supposed to be happening. Having a little bit of freedom to have folks like Dylan and Andrew and uh, Porter and the guys to, to make beer here at Treehouse uh, in coordination with myself is just kind of a relief because trying to do all the things all the time is immensely draining and this, this little exercise is reminding me of that. This will invigorate me for the future. We're lottering right now, we're rinsing that grain into the kettle and brewing as a lot of us in the industry know is 90% cleaning so we're prepping a conical fermenter for knockout, we're prepping our heat exchanger for knockout, we're weighing hops for our kettle additions, we're preparing the yeast, all those different things are happening in the background. Right now we probably have, I can't recall how long this takes to lauder, but probably 60 minutes until we have kettle full volume. I don't like a lot of caramelization in my kettle so I'm gonna kind of wait until the last minute because we'll boil for kind of a minimal amount of time if we can help it. And then yeah, we'll just keep rolling. I turned the pump off. This, this uh, one inch kind of bed of water has made its way through the grain bed right now. 
And it's kind of in this moment that I'm, I've got my fingers crossed that I crunch the numbers accurately to have the right amount of volume in the kettle when we're all said and done. I'm actually pretty pleased with the way that this looks. You know, uniformity is really important with your spars and your efficiency. But the way that this looks nice and flat and smooth across, it means we've kind of done a nice job massaging this beer as it makes its way into the kettle. And we'll see where this kettle volume is when it stops running off, which should be in just a few minutes now. Talk to me about the recipe. How'd you come up with this particular recipe? Oh, brother, I just, right off the cuff. I just wanted to make something that was very straightforward, you know, yellow in color, mildly turbid, and just kind of full of a range of hoppy character. Not, not too juicy, not too uh, piney kind of right in the middle where you have a little bit of orange tones on one end and then it finishes relatively bitter. So I put together this recipe to be kind of a extraordinarily straightforward beer. One other thing that I'm excited about for this particular batch, on this scale we were just buying hops from the homebrew store and we kind of got whatever we got. And right now we're using literally our brand new selections from just a few months ago in Yakima that just got pelletized and sent over to us. So never on this scale have I ever used hops remotely of the quality that we're about to use. To use our commercially selected, you know, hard fought hops in a homebrew batch, I'm pretty excited about. So at this point in the brew, how's your confidence? Uh, my confidence level on this particular brew is probably 80%. I think if I was to do it again right now, I would be 100% locked in, but we've been a little shaky here uh, getting back into it, but all things considered, the numbers are where they need to be, and that's frankly all that matters. So Dylan just brought our hop additions up. Dude, are you serious? That's it. 45 grams on the nose, man. That's all three additions? No, no, no. That's so that's your 10, you got your zero, and you got your 60. But it's Citrus, Simcoe, Amarillo combined. Yes, sir. So just to put that in perspective, this is what we're doing over here on the big guy. I hope I don't confuse the two. I hope I don't add this one to that by accident. That'd, that'd be, be fine bad. limit 14, dude. You'd be fine. Well, that's actually funny. How's it looking in there? We're right on the money. Super excited right now. Like I said, you have to cut your sparge water a certain volume to hit your top up volume. And the risk is that you have too much so that you under sparge or you have not enough and you kind of over sparge. But on a commercial scale, I worry about the pH of that work coming out at the bottom. But knowing that the sufficiency is so low, you know, just based on experience, I know that I don't have to worry about over sparging on this scale. It's virtually impossible. Uh, kind of based on the efficiencies that we have here versus what we have over here. Over here we test, 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 test all the time because you kind of you kind of get your density super, super low as you near the end of your lotter. Whereas right here, I bet if you were to take a gravity of your last runnings, they would be well in excess of what you'd have over here. And in addition, your pH, the buffering capacity of your malt within that lotter ton is still pretty decent. Uh, so I wouldn't worry about tannin extraction. But again, we're we are right on the money volume wise. This looks great too. I mean, just, you see like these nice bubbles, this beautiful foam. You know, if that looks like that now, oftentimes that, that creamy foam will translate into the finished beer. So we've really managed to maintain the integrity of this wort throughout this brew so far. I'm trying to homogenize the wort so I can get a nice gravity sample before I make my 60 minute addition. Because in the event that I'm low, I'm going to adjust my IBUs just a little bit. Chances are I will be low because I think that that crush was a little less fine than it needed to be. Not being hyper dialed into this system kind of affects the efficiency. So I'm just giving it a very gentle move about to try to homogenize the wort so I can get a good gravity sample before it starts to boil. homogenize our wort. We've got a nice rolling boil going here. No issues with boil over. The, the cream on top of the wort looks really nice right now. I'm about to do my 60 minute magnum hop edition. Calculated it at 18 IBUs. My density's come in just a hair below what I had intended. So I dialed back the bitterness just a hair. Uh, a lot of times brewing is like cooking. It's, it's based on know-how, taste, and then kind of adjusting on the fly when necessary. 
So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, sprinkle this guy in. So when you're home brewing, when you're Treehouse Brewing Company in the garage, during this time, the boil time, when you've got everything kind of laid out, your fermenter's ready, you've got your hop additions weighed out, boil time is when you crack a beer and you kick your feet up and you play the guitar for a little while. And as it turns out, when you own a 50 some odd thousand barrel a year brewery, you get phone calls during the boil and you have to run and deal with issues and different things like that. So it's kind of making me yearn for the past, simpler times where I'm, I got the boil in my face and I just wish I was chilling playing the guitar right now, but such is life. Did you ever brew using extracts? <laughs> yes, I brewed once using extracts. In fact, it was the very first beer that I ever made. My wife, Lauren, had originally bought me a homebrew kit. We were on vacation in Maine. And it's a funny story because it was a milk stout. And I messed it up. I messed it up really, really badly. And it's the only time that I made a huge mistake brewing a batch of beer. And as I was making it, I was kind of on the computer trying to figure out, like, what do I do? How do I make this beer good? And one of the, one of the pieces of advice was to aux auctionate your beer after you had brewed it. Little did I know that you're not supposed to do that after you ferment it. You're supposed to do it before you ferment it for yeast health purposes. So I took that fermented beer and I shook the carboy and I came back to it the next day and I'm like, oh man, I got this, this super good tip about aux auctionating your beer. It's gonna be great. And then I tried it with the wine thief and it was just, it tasted like soy sauce. At the time I vowed to make a great milk stout, which is where that's what she said the beer came from because I wanted to spite that original batch that I, it was such a tremendous failure. We have 10 minutes remaining until flame out, so we're gonna make our second hop edition of Citrus, Simcoe, and Amarillo. In they go. Fantastic. You know, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't sure what I was gonna feel when I started brewing on this guy. And frankly, the last time that I did, literally at the time, my home was mortgaged. We had a home equity line of credit out. And every batch of beer that we brewed, literally my life and the life of my co-founders uh, and everyone that participated at Treehouse at the time literally depended on it. So frankly, it's kind of nice. You know, this batch may or may not work out, but it's, it's nice to get in the saddle and make a homebrew batch and not feel like your life literally depends on it. But this is quite the setup. I mean, we have everything we need. We have cold liquor coming in from the cold liquor on the, on the cold side of the heat exchanger. We're gonna send wort obviously through the wartway. We're gonna make its way through the pump. We've got an RTD set up right here so we can see our temperature on the knockout heading into the fermenter. And then we have a sight glass so we can see the beauty and color of the wart. And then we have a block and bleed so we can take a sample off of the side to test the, the analytics of it before it makes it in the tank and of course taste the fruit of our labor. So uh, even though we're technically, I mean, we're technically commercial brewing right now and we're making it look that way, I think. Michael, I've got uh, two minutes, two minutes to flame out. These Amarillo smell amazing, unbelievable. The flame is now out, boil is complete. Making our final hop addition there. Just gonna let that little remainder of the boil give it a little bit of a stir. Man, this smells really nice. This smells really good. All right, we gotta be sterile from here on out. Part of the reason that you boil, in addition to you know making sure that some volatile organic compounds are boiled off is sterilization. So once that boil step is complete, everywhere from here through the fermenter and ultimately into the glass has to be hyper, hyper precise and sterile to make sure that microorganisms don't win the battle over the commercialized yeast that we pitch into that beer. Are you sure this is rated? Yeah, dude, I'm sure. I wouldn't steer you wrong, man. Like, have you seen my performance so far today? All right, reduce flow on the cold, please. Too cold, we need to throttle it. Yeah, I already told. I think it feels good right here, Nate. Dylan, I need more cold. More cold? There it is. Finished work. Oh. Oh, it's so good. God, it's like, like Cheerios and Tangerines. Tastes so good right now. 
maybe a touch bitter, but who knows? It's always hard to say with warp, but this is really, really nice. I mean, it tastes pretty sweet too, so I'm optimistic about our numbers. Talk to me, Goose. You're getting close, bub. All right, you tell me. You just pump off and then I'll turn my valve off over here. You're in the tank. All right. I'm gonna check my numbers. So yeah, we're targeting 1070 specific gravity heading into the fermenter. And we're currently within two one hundredths right now, one one hundredth, but our temperature is slightly oscillated. So we're dead nuts, man. Hitting your numbers makes any brewer happy. All right, Michael, I gotta get back to work. But before I do, obviously we've got some yeast we gotta pitch into this guy. I think all things considered, that was a successful brew day. We hit our numbers, uh, the wort tasted great, and so we've got good beer in the tank. This is the second part of a three-part series where hopefully if this beer ferments well and we get a nice palatable beer out of it, the next installment of this series will be on this channel where we package this beer and then finally tap it on draft. We had a lot of fun making this video. I hope you guys had fun too. If you're new to the channel, I invite you to subscribe. Don't be afraid to leave a comment below. Thank you for watching. Be good to each other, and we'll uh, see you in the next one. Take care. So we're uh, 24 hours post-pitch. Yeast is happy.